Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm Dan Mortensen. I'm the current chair of the Pacific Northwest section of the Audio Engineering Society, and we're really happy to have you here with us. So without any further ado, please welcome JJ. And here. So what I'm going to talk about is the relationship between bandwidth and the time waveform in particular. Um, there have been a lot of disputes that have come up lately about how to, uh, you know, what happens if you, what is the time resolution of, high, of, uh, of PCM, which is to say digital audio, what is the, uh, what kind of, uh, what, you know, what kind what, what, what happens if you have a sample in between, uh, sound between two samples and so on, and why that just really isn't a thing. So that's what we're gonna talk about. So you really do care about what bandwidth means, and this is important, and what it implies to the time waveform, which is what the big, the most of it will go into. Is the now, time waveform what we usually see in our DAW? Is that what you're talking about? Well, time the time waveform is actually a digitized waveform when you see it in the DAW, and it'll usually look like it has square edges, which is which it doesn't really, which is one of the problems. But we'll get to that later. Okay, but that's an important thing to remember. The time waveform is the thing that happens in sample, the next sample, the next sample. Frequency is basically the periodicity of the time waveform. But I'm not going to go into Fourier analysis tonight. There is an entire tutorial on Fourier analysis somewhere deep in the archives. Um, but basically, what the point I need to make is digital equipment always has a maximum bandwidth. In PCM systems, it's half the sampling rate. It's always actually in practical things, it's less than half the sampling rate because the, the half of the sampling rate can only be true if you actually have infinite time to do it, make the observation. So it's really this, always- This is commonly known as Nyquist? Nyquist, yes. But I mean, well, it's a Nyquist conjecture, which Shannon proved, and neither of them discussed the issue of filters. And once you introduce the issue of filters, it's actually always less than the half the sampling rate instead of less than or equal to, simply because the filter would have to have in infinite response to actually let you get to half the sampling rate. It's an interesting mathematical problem as well. Now, digital equipment has a maximum bandwidth. Analog systems have a maximum bandwidth as well, but it's a different form a bandwidth limiting it can be more gradual or sometimes it's actually very steep if you look like when you get close to it the uh, gap size of a tape head the fall off is really fast um, if you look at the fall off of a half layer amplifier it may not roll off to a megahertz but it all depends on where you're looking but in any case everything has limited bandwidth the question is how limited and what does the bandwidth limiting look like so something I'm going to talk about, what happens if you miss the sam completely misses the input impulse or a sound between two samples? Um, the, 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 to, to make the, the, too, the too long didn't read version is you can't actually do that inside of the bandwidth of the, sim the system. And then the second one is what is the actual frequency content of a signal such as a tone burst? And when you see people putting in tone bursts and they look distorted, is that a problem? Well, no. There are a number of issues here. And for instance, if you have a pure frequency, that means the signal is infinite in time. So obviously, you never have a truly pure frequency. That doesn't mean you can't use frequency analysis, though, because the, the error can fall off the edge of either the analog or digital noise very quickly if you do it right. So the point is, is while you can never have a perfect measurement of frequency, you can get to a point where physics doesn't let you distinguish typically in under a second. So let's talk about the math. Like I said, all signals that have a finite duration have infinite bandwidth. There are a number of people who have argued that this means the sampling can't work. That is, of course, wrong. The reality of it is, is that if you have a limit time limited signal, it's going to roll. It's the 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 energy is going to roll off rapidly 
above some, about, you know, about outside of that signal. And that way it rolls off is going to be very soon below the digital noise or the analog noise, you know, whatever you've got. The, it's basically a combination of physics and mathematics. You can't actually have an infinite bandwidth in the real world. And when you hear the term, some people talk about infinite impulse response, that doesn't mean it stays above the noise floor. In fact, it takes a crack. Almost every kind of signal you generate that way takes an immediate crash dive and is gone. Well, I'll give you a relationship later, but basically if you look at the time resolution of the signal multiplied by the frequency resolution of the signal, that, get, that is greater than a constant where the constant is simply set by the question of how accurately you want to be able to resolve the two. So basically, it's like a Heisenberg, Heisenberg uncertainty. If you want to know resolution to one hertz, you had better have at least one second of a signal because that's, that mm -hmm. constant is rarely and only for a few, few special mathematical cases does it ever get below one. So if you want to resolve one hertz, you better observe at least one second worth of signal. That's life. Because it's one cycle per second of one hertz, right? So that's well, it's it, it basically it means that if you have say a half a second of observation, that means that even if you do Fourier analysis or something like that, you will have a two hertz ambiguity. Okay. It doesn't matter how you try to do it, there will be an ambiguity if you have a shorter period. If you okay. if that times yeah yeah it's just all it's, gotta go up down and back again or you you don't know what you got yeah it's not even true quite but in jet because the point is it could be just you could be measuring the bandwidth of narrowband noise but if the bandwidth of that narrowband noise is one hertz you're not going to measure that bandwidth until you've observed enough of it to know what the bandwidth is it's a question of observation it doesn't matter what kind of signal it is now, hey, hey, oh, hey, JJ, um, yeah, got a question from uh, Rick here. He yeah. said, uh, given a band limiting filter of finite slope, how much attenuation should the signal see once you reach the Nyquist limit? Um, it's best if it's down below the uh, whatever the uh, resolution of the, uh, you know, if you have 16 bits, it should be down 16 bits. If you have 24 bits, it should be down 24 bits. Um, very often it's not quite that, but that would be the right way to do it if you want my opinion. There's this entirely separate argument about half band filters, which we will not get into today. But the answer to that is that you should basically, in order to be accurate to your specified number of bits, your filter should be gone by the time you hit half the sampling rate under all circumstances. Okay, does that answer the question? Yeah, okay. Now, in sampled systems, the system bandwidth and noise floor set the time resolution. This isn't obvious immediately, but we'll get there later. Now, some pictures. I'm going to show you a whole bunch of pictures. You're going to see a pairs of time domain signal on top and their spectrum, which is to say their frequency response in the bottom. Um, I have plotted all of the spectrum from uh, zero dB, which is the peak, down to minus 120 dB, just so you can see the range in the uh, data. The top plot is the time domain. The bottom plot is the amplitude spectrum. It's not the full spectrum. The full spectrum includes phase. We're just doing the amplitude spectrum. Expressed in, it's expressed in dB because you want to be able to see the roll off. And I'll point, I'll use some examples of both signals. And now when you look at these, you have to watch the horizontal scale of the time domain because we're going to scale up from one sample at a megahertz to many, many, many samples at a megahertz. So the scale has to change. Um, the frequency scale does not change. This is the second one does not change. So let's look. This is showing what the canonical impulse is. You hear the word impulse response. In the analog domain, an impulse was a signal with an energy of one and zero duration. You don't see that in the digital domain. What you see in the digital domain 
is something which has a value of one, but only at one sample and is otherwise zero. So now this shows the spectrum of an impulse. You notice the spectrum of the impulse is flat. Now, what is this telling us? This is telling us that if you put this into your digital system, you can't expect to capture this for the simple reason that it's, you know, say if you're doing a 20 standard 20 kilohertz pass, pass band, you can't possibly fit this half a megahertz pass band into 20 kilohertz. It just doesn't fit. So you never get this at the input to your A to D converter after the filter. It does not exist in a real system. What happens if we make it a little bigger? Well, for basically the pulse. Now, see, this is why you cannot fall between samples. Anything that falls completely between two samples is has an enormous bandwidth. If you have an enormous bandwidth as many times the sampling frequency, you're not doing sampling right. It's just something that you cannot happen to have happen. Now, when you have with the limit, when you limit the width of a signal, um, that will change the that will change the frequency resolution or the bandwidth. But once you filter that one sample pulse, you, what you will see then is what's called the impulse response of the filter. It will be much wider than one sample, but now you will observe it perfectly well in the sampled signal. But only, you only observe the part of that signal that actually has energy inside your passband. You will not ever observe that stuff up at half a megahertz. Okay, now this is 0.93 milliseconds, which is basically two samples. In microseconds. Yeah. Microseconds, sorry, yeah. Mm -hmm. You notice that rolls off to zero at exactly half the sample. Now that, there's a lesson here. That goes to zero at half of the sampling rate. And that shows very clearly the narrowest signal that you can ever have that even has any kind whatsoever of filtering done to it at the sampling rate. Now, as we'll see in a minute, that's pretty lousy filtering, but this means that you can never actually capture anything within a given bandwidth unless you sample it twice that bandwidth, which is restating the Nyquist conjecture. Or it's also saying that if your filter has an impulse response that's less than two samples long, it's not a proper filter. In fact, you want a filter that's much longer than that, but we'll see that in a minute. Now, it shows us if you have to even be possibly inside the system bandwidth, it has to be two samples long. And that's not very much inside the ba system bandwidth. And we're talking about, about roughly one bit resolution in the captured data. Is that a restatement of what we think of the Nyquist theorem is that the highest frequency has to have two samples uh, per yes. cycle? It's, it's, a, it's sort of a restatement, but it's I'm doing this from the basic mathematics at this point, but that the mathematics that prove the Nyquist theorem, yes, relate, yes. It's the same, it's the same thing said another way. Okay, if, you good, have good. Less than two, if you have less than two samples of something, then it's not in band. Ever. Then you have aliasing at least. You have aliasing or imaging or, well, your system isn't linear and characterizing it is not a good idea. Cool. So basically at the sampling rate of the pulse, that was two sample pulse. Now we're gonna go to four samples. Now you can see, yeah, this, this now basically moves the first that first zero down in, by another octave. You now see, you have a zero at two and a half kilohertz, sorry, sorry, 250, it's actually 256 uh, kilohertz, give or take, and a second zero up at the Nyquist rate again. But you notice now, if you look at this level here, this peaks up at about minus six dB. What that means, that means if you have a two tap filter, you only ever get six dB of isolation from the, um, from out of band signals. So this doesn't have very much aliasing production at all. And now, see it rolls off, you get you get a you get a one bit or maybe two if you do some special processing. But I'm gonna not, now I'm gonna make the pulse wider and wider and wider, and we'll see what happens. 
Okay, so now I made the Pell's, you know, basically 8, 16, 32, 64. And now you see what happens. Now it's these, if you look here, now this down here, this spectrum is now starting to roll off a bit. Still not rolling off very much. It's rolling off 40 dB. Um, so you're not really getting that great a rejection. And what but are each of these notes? Uh, each of what? Each, well, this is like the four, this, the four. What? The this four that eight, are up there. Yeah. This is eight. This one is eight samples. Okay. 16, 32, 64 samples. Okay. And as you make them longer, you see how you get more roll off about the thing. But like I said, this isn't actually the good way to make a filter. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But the point is, is as you do this, you see this, this first band getting narrower. So you are getting frequency resolution down here at the bottom, but you're not getting a lot of out of band rejection. So let's go even longer. It's not getting where, it's not getting low very fast. So what's the problem? Well, you saw all those sharp edges. Sharp edges mean literally that if you have a sharp edge in a signal, it cannot roll off quickly. If you have a sharp edge in a signal, it will not have a spectrum that rolls off quickly. It's fundamental mathematics. Um, we're going to do that again up here, but remember, sharp edges means wide spectrum. This comes out very loudly when we talk about doing measurements and look at D-day converters. Because if you see a sharp edge coming out of a D-day converter, it has a very wide spectrum. And it shouldn't necessarily. So it's like, is that like the, the uh, sine waves may need to make a, a square wave? And how much you need for uh, that? I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. It's coming. OK, now I'm doing a lot longer here. I forget how long these are, but you notice these things are now 10 to the minus 3 and 10 to, 10 to the minus 6 for the time scale. And you notice, yes, it's rolling off. It's rolling off more. But you still, we're still only down about 60 dB, even in this big long thing. But you notice this point here is now getting quite narrow. So that means you're actually starting to see that you get frequency resolution in some sense, because you're now you have a wide app. This is basically an aperture, and you can see how you get narrower frequency response because of the wide aperture. You do, however, get pretty much lousy rejection. And again, these have sharp edges. So like I said, there's that edges, they hurt. You don't want to get rid of these discontinuities. If you have the continuous time domain, a discontinuity means when the signal changes immediately. If you have a digital signal, um, the way you don't really have a mathematically a discontinuity, but if you have a very large jump in the signal, which is to say also a very large spike in the rate of change. Um, those dis discontinuity like that rolls off at 6 dB per octave. It's not a good idea, it's the law, so to speak. It's how the mathematics works, it's how the Fourier transform converts that signal into a frequency spectrum. It's not something you can get around. So, well, what am I talking about? The derivative is the rate of change of the signal. A chain, a very large change in the rate of change of a signal is effectively the same as the analog waveform changing instantaneously or nearly instantaneously since you can't really do instantaneously. Physics doesn't permit, doesn't permit it. So if you have a single spike in the, in the continuous domain, it just goes up for infinitely short amount of time and comes back down, that means you have an infinite positive change and an infinite negative change in the derivative. So the derivative looks like this, one goes up, one goes down, but they're, they're overlapped on each other. Hmm. And that's called a doublet. A doublet in the derivative means you have a flat spectrum. That's basically just saying the, the impulse I showed at the beginning again. In the digital domain, you won't see that at the same time because you only have one sample. What you'll see in the digital domain would be a spike maximum in one, in one direction and a maximum in the other direction. And that has 
exactly the same characteristic. It has an infinite bandwidth, but in the digit, and when you're in the digital, the sample domain, it means infinite only means you go up to half the sampling rate. Half of the sampling rate basically maxed to infinity in the analog sense. Now, when you have a sudden positive change, but it's not immediately adjacent to a sudden negative change, now you have two single discontinuities that aren't adjacent to each other. Now that will roll off at 6 dB per octave. In other words, a square wave rolls off at 6 dB per octave because you see a spike in the positive direction, nothing, a spike in a negative direction, nothing, a spike in the positive direction, so on. That, that, you following that, uh, Steve? It's the it's your you're doing the change again. It's, it's your tracking yeah. changes. When they change, then they stay, and then they change. So it's again. Yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing the how you build a single sine wave and what it takes to make a, a square wave of the well, same. Here's the thing about a sine wave: you have to realize a sine wave never has a discontinuous derivative. Has it never changed? It never does. It's always smooth. It's always moving. Yes, it's always moving, never has a discontinuous derivative. So that's why a sine wave can have only one frequency. And it's not a co complex waveform. Right. It's complex wave waveforms are made up of multiple sine waves. Yes. And, and that's so why in the analog, in the continuous domain, you can regenerate a sine wave, or sorry, a square wave from an infinite bunch of sine waves. And the interesting thing is in the analog domain, if you do that, you have no energy error when you reconst reconstitute the uh, square wave, but you will actually have an amplitude error. It's a small amplitude error and it's infinitely narrow. Hmm. If that makes your head hurt, it should, mm -hmm. but it means that there's no error in the actual signal that actually gets out because you can't, you know, a zero energy signal does not. It doesn't reproduce anything. well. It doesn't re yes exactly but that's the thing but that's only true for the continuous domain and that happens because of the infinite derivatives hmm. if you bandwidth limit the signal in the analog domain you no longer see those and that's why you can that's apply anti-aliasing right that's not even anti-aliasing it's a fundamental phenomenon called the gibbs ear gibbs's ears it's uh, the mathematics will get, gives me a splitting headache. I mean, it, I figured it was just me. And then when all the mathematicians I knew at Bell Labs tell me it gives them a splitting headache too, I just sort of said, okay, I believe you. Like imaginary numbers. <laughs> well, imaginary numbers are much simpler. They're just another oh. axis. All right. Well, but, uh, okay, but the, the point is, is that among other things, since you can never actually have innocent bandwidth in the continuous domain, that eliminates some of the arguments people have made for why digital audio can't work. Some people argue that it can't work because you have these, these zero energy errors. But in fact, in a real signal that's physically realizable in analog or digital or anything else, you can't have those er that you can't have those errors anyhow because it has a finite derivative. It can be a big derivative, but it's still finite. Okay. And somebody like Gary Gottlieb in. If anybody in the audience has more questions that I'm not getting and have confusions, maybe we'll, the, the, I guess the, uh, the nice thing to do is just let him carry on because it might be answered in the next slide. That's possible. So the point is, is if you have a, 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 a big derivative, nothing, a big derivative, nothing, that's going to roll off at 60 dB per octave. And it's interesting to note that it doesn't matter whether or not it's a pulse, just like this, like that. It doesn't matter if it goes negative or positive. If there's space between them, it's going to roll off at 6 dB per octave. There may be other effects too, due to the spectrum of the actual signal, but it's going to roll off at 6 dB per octave. Now, this is basically a way to think of it. If you have a one sample peak, it has the doubled in derivative, the spectrum is flat. If you have a unit impulse in the derivative, it's a jump in the signal, but there's no, but not, not an impulse, that's gonna roll off at 6 dB. That's a square wave. If you have the unit impulse in the second derivative, 
the square wave in the first derivative, triangle wave in the signal, that's now 12 dB per octave roll off, which you think about it, that's how you generate a triangle wave, right? 12 dB per octave. Now, generally signals that have a mixture of these are not easily characterized, but in general, the lowest order discontinuity, and by that I mean the thing that has this biggest unit impulse in the lowest derivative is going to set the roll off. It'll set the it'll certainly set the final roll off at high frequency. It may not set the roll off at low frequencies. Is this oh, by definition this is only in complex waveforms? Because well, there's, there's it's there's true in all spectral. Well, it's, it's true in all waveforms, but sometimes the size of the peaks is small enough that it doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of the edges. Now you notice. On this side, we have our pulse and we have our spectrum of the pulse. You notice up at this end here, we have a very, very, very narrow, that goes to zero right at, at DC. So you have a very, very, very narrow frequency resolution, but it only rolls off to 60 dB. Now, on this side, we have a Hermes optimized, Hermes optimized filter that has the same length as this pulse. Now you notice two things. The first thing is now the passband is much wider because the center of this is narrower, okay? And it's the center of this that sets the bandwidth of the passband. But because now we've gotten rid of the discontinuities, you notice the, the amount of aliasing this filter from it is basically gone. And this is just basically one of these things you can't get away from. The faster, the wider the bandwidth, the narrower the filter. The faster the filter rolls off, the longer the filter, but not necessarily right in the middle. You know, this filter goes to 10 to the minus five on both ends. And it goes, only goes up to near one at the, in the middle. This filter is one all the time, has much tighter, really low frequency resolution, but it doesn't roll off very well. This, in this filter, the final, the final step before it goes to zero is 10 to the minus five, which gives us 120 dB to the beginning of the far, to the far frequency roll off. So there you go. It's just the same problem. It's just that this is optimized in a way which gets rid of, basically it reduces all the low order discontinuities to a very, very, very small number. And so this stuff that happens out here is below 120 dB. But out here, you notice that this band now is very wide because the center of the filter is very wide. And the thing that's interesting about that is now I plotted three here. I did this, these are anti-aliaser filters to convert between 192 for 44, 48, and 96. Now, if you look, the one for 44 is 560 samples long. It's got, I chose these links to give you the same amount of roll off so you can compare it. But you see what happens here. Now this, these, if you look at the center of these three, they look almost the same. But you notice the edges of them are what gets longer, 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 longer. So here, when you have to roll off really fast, this becomes a longer filter. Because remember again, if you, have something that's really sharp, it's got a long impulse response, right? If you have something that's not very sharp, it has a shorter impulse response. And now this, show, this also shows another interesting effect here because there's, this cutoff is wide enough now that there's substantial energy in the cutoff region. So that means that this space here gets a little bit narrower because effectively the passband of this is a little bit wider even though the passband in spec is 20 to 20K for all three of these. Is this a benefit for higher uh, sampling rate, high res files? It means that you can have a shorter filter. Now, this, this is using an FIR filter. I'll talk about other filters in a minute, but it means you have a shorter filter, but you have more data and 
the thing, the irony of this, and I've seen people that seen systems that do this, when you go to 96, I've seen what happened, but people do is they push the cut up to 44. So they have the same cutoff, except this, instead of moving to 20, moves to 40, moves to 44 for converted for a 96 kilohertz um, capture system, which means that you still have this, if you go to 96 and you have the same, the, the difference here is you have four kilohertz between the end of the stop pass band and the beginning of the stop band, okay? And if you still have four kilohertz between the beginning and end of the stop band and you do this at 96, you're still gonna have a filter with this time length. It doesn't help you in terms of filter length. It doesn't mean that you have to calculate twice as many samples. So it all depends on how you actually do the roll off. See here, we roll off between 20 and 48. So that is now instead of, that's uh, 28 kilohertz pat stop band. And you notice with the 28 kilohertz, sorry, transition band. So you notice that the 28 kilohertz transition band, the filter is really short. Got it? it, it so it, there's, there's a lot of trade. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Michael Clements asks, uh, does this imply that wider transition band gives narrower slash better impulse response? Well, it gives you narrower. You can argue about what better is. And so that's, I mean, that's more efficient as well. If it's more to... efficient, certainly. Um, in terms of linear effect, there's no, there's no effect. If you're worried about nonlinear interactions, with the hearing apparatus, it is remotely possible and there's no evidence for it, but it is remotely possible. You might get into some trouble with nonlinearities due to the hearing apparatus, but that's nonlinear systems. And I've given that talk elsewhere. The point being is that if this, if this filter width is long enough that the, you know, don't forget filter has, the air has filters in it and the maximum width of its filter in the ear is about four kilohertz. So if this, if the width of this filter is more, if the cutoff of this filter is less than four kilohertz, which is say the impulse response of this filter is longer than the impulse response of the ear, it is marginally conceivable that you might have an interaction if you consider nonlinear effect. If you go to some place where you have something like this, there's certainly not any nonlinear effect. So that's the question of what you call by better. I don't know if that helps uh, Michael's questions, but uh, he maybe he will tell us in a minute if that answers his question. The question of what's better depends on how much how many CPU you want to send, how much you want to, oh, okay, good. He said, yes, and answered, thank you, Michael. So the, you know, it's a, that's a question outside of this discussion for now. I can talk. I think I have a. I have a talk. I've done a talk on that somewhere. <laughs> okay. So what happened? What we did is we knocked down the first order discontinuities below their below minus under twenty dB. We also used a particular kind of filter de, de, oops, design mm -hmm. that uh, that gives you guarantees basically the optimum equal repo stru structure. So this, in a sense, this filter here, the filter I've used for this, design I've used for this and all of these, in a sense, it is an optimum. Then you can say comfortably, you can't do better than that. The point is that for audio, this 120 dB takes you from the threshold of discomfort, which is also, by the way, well above the threshold of short-term damage to below the noise level of the atmosphere. So there you have it. You, you can never do something perfectly, but you can beat anything that you can actually present to the sub, to the, to the ear. Because you can't, you, you can't, you can, you can, arb, you can make these filters arbitrarily good and they're still reasonably short and easily executed in the modern processor. And the way I told, chose that filter two slides ago was actually not an accident. This is exactly what you would need to convert the uh, 
the original sampling rate to 44.1. That's what, that, that wasn't a coincidence. Now, if you look at the, you can't tell from the plot very well, but the, set, the middle, middle of that filter is between 42 and 43 samples. And the length of two samples is 48 kilohertz is 43 samples. Once again, you get that lesson. You gotta have two samples, no choice, hmm. no way. It's just, this comes about, you know, this is generated from a completely different method of solution. And it's, there it is, it's still exactly identical. So and you a, can't, so just go a ahead. Minor, minor point of clarification, JJ. Uh, a yeah. minute ago, you said uh, 44 one, but I think it was 48. Is that right? Yes, I see that now. I did it at 48 and I apologize. <laughs> Because we'll, we'll, uh, we'll allow it. Well, I don't know. What can I say? But yes, that was at 48. And that, and again, you can't get a signal under two samples long, even if you only look at the middle of that filter. You can't get a signal that's under two samples long ever into that system. Once again, you can't miss anything in band. This and the particular filter I used was a May exchange filter. It's a particular way to make the most efficient symmetric filter. People a lot of times, and I see a lot of people talking about sync filters, which is sine X over X type filters. The problem with sine X over X type filters is they are not optimum. They, a sine X over X filter is the only way to get infinitely fast rejection from a filter. That's the good news. The bad news is they don't give you the shortest filter. They don't give you the best in, in you know, they don't give you the best in, in, um, in band uh, ripple and they don't give you the best out of band stop band loss. Rejection. So life is like that. Sorry, somebody said something. I just said rejection. Yeah, you know, so the point is, is a sync filter you can window and we did a whole talk a while ago about windows, but when you window it, the frequency response of the window comes into play. And by the time you make the window complicated enough to get good rejection, you have a big long filter again. It's just, just as easy to just use an optimization process and get what you want directly. In most cases, nothing is ever always such as life. Now tone bursts, well, now that we've established what tone, you know, why this is not going to be a narrow band signal, this is gonna be probably pretty obvious, but let's look at some tone bursts. Okay. Now, so you know that peak here, you see this, this peak and a peak and a peak here, that is the center frequency of the tone burst. That's what the frequency of that sine wave is. Are these arbitrary frequencies? This is actually, I think I did, if I recall correctly, I did 10 kilohertz, but it doesn't Wait. matter there. This, these sine wave is all is the same frequency for all three of these. Okay. And you notice the peak comes out at the same place, but you notice with this, the thing, you know, this spreads out to like 70, minus 70, Minus, minus close to 70, and I can't see this one for the zoom appurtenance there, but it goes out a little bit down to about minus 100. The point being is that if you have a one cycle or a 10 cycle or a 16 cycle tone burst, it is a very broadband signal. Because if you, what happens here is if you look at the derivative right here, you go directly from the maximum derivative of the sine wave to zero. So you have a big step in the derivative. Once again, you get that slow roll off. So the answer about tone bursts is you wanna get that 120 kilohertz, that one cycle 20 kilohertz burst through your 48 kilohertz PCM rate. No, uh -uh. that's because it's got a bandwidth about 300 kilohertz wide minimum and you're not going to get it through. You can get the part that remains under 20 kilohertz and that this is more important. That's the only thing you should ever get. Got it? That's the only part you should see is the part that's actually under 20 kilohertz. So you will see ringing up to it. You will see ringing after. That's how 
the bandwidth gets limited to 20 kilohertz. Now, my point, well, any finite link signal is theoretically infinite bandwidth. You can't, there are a couple of very simple things. You can't make this continuous waveform. Physics literally does not allow it. You would have to have infinite acceleration, infinite force, infinite propagation velocity, or some other, some other things you might get falling into a black hole, but that's not what we're dealing with here. And even when you don't have, when you have digitally the, the effect of a discontinuity in the digital thing, that can always be managed to a level that physics cannot accommodate. You can always get quickly and easily down to the noise floor of the system. So yes, you can limit bandwidth. That means yes, you can sample a signal. Despite what arguments you hear from some people, yes, you can sample the signal. Okay, so what do you do? Well, you filter. What is a filter? We did a talk on this close to 20 years ago. Filter is basically combining the current signal with the history of the signal. That's all a filter is. It mixes together samples from different times. That's what all linear filters do. There are lots of ways to build filters. There's FIR filters. That means finite impulse response. And yes, even those pulses, which are crappy filters, even though they're lousy filters, they're filters. They might not be very useful, but they are filters. And there are things called infinite impulse response filters or IIR filters. They use your cursive methods to get a long impulse response from a small number of variables. But in they, they just as well tail off to zero. So in all cases, the filter response is going to tail off to zero except in one very special case. And that is if you want a constant delay filter. If you want a constant delay filter, you have to, the impulse response to the signal has to be either symmetric about the center or anti-symmetric about the signal center and have no, and have no DC component. Those are the only two possibilities. That's rather limiting. If you think about it, so if you have an infinite impulse response filter that's going to be symmetric, that means you have to wait an infinite amount of time for the filter to get to the center. You know, this is not easily realized. It also means that half of the poles in the filter have poles outside the unit circle or outside the in the left half plane, which is to say they're unstable. So you're never going to get that constant delay characteristic out of an F out of an IIR filter. Now when I say constant delay, I mean that the phase shift is equal to 2 pi times F times T. That is the formula for doing literally a delay time delay in a Fourier transform. So if you put in t equals two, the phase, and you delay the signal by two seconds compared to the original, you're going to find that the only thing that happens is you put a big steep line on the phase. And anytime the phase shift of, a, of something is a pure is a line, that's a pure delay. Any deviation from the lane is the actual phase shift. Now. The IR filter is another way of doing a filter impulse response, but you can't make it symmetric. Sometimes it's useful. I mean, if you're doing the initial, the initial filter for an oversampling system and a recursive filter is an IR filter, recursive filter, same thing, is a perfectly good choice for the first thing because any phase shift is not going to matter because it's going to be at too high of a frequency when you finally get down to baseband. I've got a question and I'm seeing some things in the chat. Yeah. So Filters. Now, when we're talking about filters, the is this primarily, and I hate to use the word, an anti-aliasing filter? Is it a filter to get the other images out of the way, and that's the only reason you need a filter? Like it's for an engineering. And uh, so, but the reasons that we're even concerned about filters is to maintain the given bandwidth that our ears can hear in this case. Well, in this case, what we're using a filter for is to make sure that we have legal sampling. Legal sampling, which means that there's nothing uh, more, higher, no higher frequencies than half the sampling frequency or so. 
Yeah. So with the, the Nyquist, so that you're ensured that you have two uh, two samples per your highest frequency you want to capture. Yeah. Yeah. To answer Steve's question, I see in the chat there, a filter is simply a way to frequency shape a signal. And the filters we're talking about here, we're trying to do frequency shaping so that you only get the proper frequencies into the into the sampler, or you only have to get the proper frequencies out of the resampled signal. Basically, so we're, we're using it to get rid of frequencies that we don't want. It's like a like a really good EQ that's way out of our out of the audio range. Is it basically an EQ? Well, an EQ is a filter. Yeah. Uh, it's just a filter that does much less usually than an anti-aliasing filter. But yeah, it's just a filter, you know, EQ is a filter, um, loudness. A low pass filter that's really sharp. Yeah, well, it doesn't even have to be that sharp in some cases, but it's uh, a low right. pass filter. For audio, it's a low pass filter. One of the things I wasn't gonna bring up, but you pointed out is if, if you know, when I say that the bandwidth of the signal has to be less than half of the sampling rate, you don't have to do a baseband filter. Instead of going DC to 22 kilohertz, 22.05 kilohertz for a 44 kilohertz, you know, 44.1 kilohertz, you could just as well sample 22.05 to 44.1. You could just as well do that hmm. and, cap and capture that range, but you better reject all of the stuff outside of that or it's going to garble the signal. Hmm. So there's and really there are images that are actually the same images, right? From around yeah. zero, and then yeah. around the sampling rate, and then around yeah. the well, that's either. yeah. But the point is, if you sample the original thing between FS over two and FS, you'll just get an image of that back down into the baseband, which is over here. Yeah, and you can use that and prosecute and and process that all you want. And then if you convert it back, you still have a valid system, but now your system bandwidth is still FS over two. Hmm. So you can even modulate a signal hmm. up and down in frequency. I mean, you can do lots of things like that, um, but you don't do that in audio because what we care about is 20 to 20. Sounds good. And I think that yeah. things are, are settling out in the chat as well. Of, yep. Uh, Right on, crossovers filter, that's good. good yeah, crossovers filter. And they do even better um, when you make them digitally, if you want my opinion, but that's mm -hmm. a different that's a different talk. Okay, now what, what I'm saying, the only way to get a symmetric IR filter is to have half of the half of the poles unstable. Yeah, you can, in mathematics works fine. That doesn't help. And you can get mostly pure delay with, and FIR with IIR filters, but you have to put a whole bunch of all pass sections in it. Well, I don't, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I should say it's usually not worth it. I might even just say it's just not worth it. Hmm. Nowadays, CPU is cheap and, you know, 0.001 precision analog parts are not. Joe Grisso can probably tell you all about that. <laughs> okay, so. Some words on filters. Well, we talked a bit about filters. This is an entire field. This is not one or two people. This is an entire field with thousands of contributors, thousands of papers. We did a filter design tutorial at the AES. We only got like 40 people in the audience, but they stayed for the entire thing and there was an awful lot of coffee consumed. Ditto for the one I did for the PNW. There was only like 12 people, but again, there was a lot of coffee consumed. This is an extremely mathematical process. And unless you want to become a filter design expert, you probably want to simply take a CAM design. I mean, it's uh, complicated and how to do optimum filters that have certain arbitrary characteristics is completely unsolved. And so, it's already done for you in your DAW and everything, so you don't really have to worry about it. This is more of an amplification. The only question is, did they do it right? And unfortunately, I'm not going to name products, but they don't always. How can you and, tell? Is it the way you hear it? Does it make a difference in, in the audience? Some of, them, some of them have stood out as hearing immediately by hearing a very high frequency monitor wine that was way over half of the sampling rate. 
come down and land at about nine kilohertz. That was not pleasant. <laughs> Sometimes you can tell things like that. Sometimes you can hear distortion because they have round off air. There's a number of things that go wrong in DAWs that, well, I think a lot of people started using analog design and analog models when they started doing digital DAWs, digital systems. And the fact is there is a different practice for very good reasons in digital. And I don't think the world is actually completely there yet. Some parts of it are annoyingly distant. When you record onto, uh, onto tape, for yeah. instance, you, got, you get to push that so you above the noise floor and you get up and you get a little compression, you do the same thing, 16-bit audio, you want to stay up so you're out of the quantization distortion, but 24-bit audio, you're going to want to come down and allow for all those small bits. So that's- Well, that's one of the things you have to remember that if you clip a signal in the digital domain, all of those, all of those distort line, the, all those spect spectral lines that are distortion that go above half a second will alias back down into the bass pit, into the pass band. The way to prove this is to take um, 43.1 divided by three kilohertz sine wave and clip it symmetrically digitally. And you will not like that incredibly piercing whine that shows up at a kilohertz. And I think, I believe the way I, that was described the time we did that talk was described as a, a, a signal which will never be played again. Okay. It's not, it's not a good thing to do. So moving on a little bit, I think. We good? Yeah, I've, I've got, there's some other things but we'll we'll let that go for now. It's all good. Carry on. Yes. Yeah, I'll just uh, saying to somebody who says you can you can create easily create an FIR that has an arbitrary response. The question is, can you do it efficiently? And that's still an unsolved problem. And there's there's another question that was to me directly about um, high res audio versus CD, and that's that might be a different conversation as well in a way because the, uh, yeah. the having this the slow. What I was thinking is that you have the, the slower. Uh, stop band as compared to having to be really, really sharp yeah. in, in a higher uh, sampling rate world yes. as compared to the 44.1 CD. Yeah, and the back and the back and the back channel discussion there about um, all pass filters, absolutely all pass filters are IIR. There's, if you want to go to the math, the math of it, that's always, that's, that's absolutely true. But, um, you can approximate it pretty well with an FIR, but yes. I mean, this is what uh, Juan and Michael Clements and uh, Alexi are talking about is not as deep as I wanted to go into filter design here. Or is it deeper than what you wanted to go into? Is that it's, Sorry, I said that backwards. I, yeah, yeah. That, would, that would be a good subject for a round table in filter design, but not this. The round table's in the chat, so carry okay. on. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. And uh, just so you know, Juan, the, the question is, you can create an arbitrary filter, but the catch is, is you can't necessarily have an optimized length arbitrary filter. Okay, so now how do we limit bandwidth and reconstruction? Well, you have imaging just like the alias. There's two steps, sampling or resampling in this case and quantization, well, when we capture, we have sampling and quantization. Um, something to remember that it's possible to have sampling without quantization. The telcos used to do this all the time. Um, I mean, there, until 1970s, a lot of long distance circuits were time delay multi multiplex. So that's sampling without quantization. But um, when you get back to reconstruction, now you have to remember that you have images as well. And now you were asking about square waves. First thing I just remind you of the spectrum of a square wave. You have a sine, you have a square wave, right? Sine wave, square wave, spectrum of sine wave, just what you expect. Spectrum of square wave with the same sequency. Now you notice here, this just rolls off just like expected. And as, as a point though, mm -hmm. what each one of those lines are, 
is yeah, a, a, a frequency of a sine wave that is at a level which is less, but each one of those frequencies are being shown. So the sine wave over here, you have a single magnitude spike there in your spectrum, which is the frequency, uh, the, the amplitude of this frequency across, and now in the square wave, it adds that frequency plus the odd harmonics in a reducing method in order to get the corners on your square wave. Um, mm -hmm. The the lower, because when we test for 20 to 20K, you put in a 1K square wave, and if it's square, then you know that you've gotten the whole bandwidth through. So yeah. if you take this, um, the lower right-hand corner piece and you pull and erase the top half of those, you're gonna have rounded edges there, right? That did, and you have no choice. You've taken away those frequencies. Now they're another, actually poking it out into the squaring it up. Yep. Now, one thing I want to point out too is notice these are all equally spaced at F0, 3 F0, 5 F0. You notice that's the uniform spacing. And that's going to be a point that I'm going to make again later because you're going to see something else that isn't uniform spaced. But let's talk about now a reconstructed signal. First, it's supposed to be bandwidth limited. No discontinuities. Nope. Have no out of bounds signals. So now I'm going to put up two samples. Okay, which one of these is right? Right. Okay, it looks like this one on the left is stair stepped as if. Yes. And the one on the, the right seems to have had those high frequency square makers taken out. Yes. So it makes it smooth. Is that correct? Yes. And what about it? Well, this is the, this left. The thing you saw on the left is what an awful lot of people think comes out of a DAC. The right is a cosine. So, what's the spectrum of these? Well, I think you. Now that we've been through all this, you're probably going to guess what the spectrum is going to look like. But the point is, the left is not what comes out of any DAC that works right. There's no space that, steps. If that comes out of your DAC your DAC is missing an anti-imaging filter and somebody needs to be scolded. Okay. So what's the difference between an anti-imaging and anti-aliasing filter? Nothing. Excellent, thank you. I mean, they have the same exact requirements. Because we're trying to get rid of this one. Because they're, they're, they're bounced all the way up as far yep. as images and you want to get rid of it. Because if these go over, then you've got some energy here. That and you start seeing the edges down. and you start seeing funny looking edges. And you start so, hearing things lower frequencies that are that are folded over. No, ne not not necessarily. Not unless you have nonlinearities, because those they're the frequencies are coming out now really are at a higher frequency because hmm, the okay. images come. Yes, as, the, as now, they come by. Yeah, carry on. Yeah, but if you look here now, let's look at the spectra. Notice here we have just what we expect, and that's below the Nyquist limit on the right side. On the left side, we have exactly one signal below the Nyquist rate. All the rest of this stuff hmm. is above the Nyquist rate. Now, you notice these are no longer uniformly spaced because these come at FS plus or minus frequency, 2FS plus or minus 3FS, so, that, so they are not harmonics. They are images. One of the things to remember about images is they're not harmonics and they may be, I think the polite term is disturbingly and harmonic. So then you see the squares and you cut that off and it, you get the thing on the right. Well, you, more to the point, open. the way the waveform here on the right was created was I made a big long section of this waveform. It was like, I forget how long it is, but it's like 10 seconds long. And I stuffed it through. I fit that, in fact, the filter that I showed a minute ago with the rolling between 40 and 48, I stuffed it into that filter, and the waveform in the right is what comes out. So this isn't done by formula. This is this is actually this waveform filtered only to have one signal, one one just have the signal below half the sampling rate. So the point is, you don't ever see this coming out. If you see this coming out of your DAC. You and if it's not what it. if it's not what went in, yeah. Well, <laughs> you can't put this into your DAC ah, either. Okay, good because it's so it's so straight. Yeah, you can't put it's, this into the DAC, 
and you had better not get it back out either. And so that's the discontinuities that are not allowed yep. because of filters, because of bandwidth. Because of the filters take out the spectral contents that provide the edges. Right, right. And if you look in, there's a talk I did like close to 20 years ago again at the, at, at the Pacific Northwest, there's a talk on A to D converters that actually shows in one of the slides what happens if you start with the sine wave, you add in one pair of aliases at, or images, add in another set of, and as it goes up, surprise, surprise, you get the square wave. Mm -hmm. But you know, that's just- That's probably where I learned experiment. it actually, from that, yep. from your first talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's good to okay. know. Okay, now, all that squareness, it's just not right. You shouldn't see that. Now, this leads us to another problem. And a lot of waveforms just, you know, a digital signal does not have any in between the samples. There's no such thing. It's, it's, infinitely, it's infinitely short samples every so often. It's a There's, value. All it is it's is a, a value. Value. Values it's a don't value have width. And another value and another value. There's no width. Right. So, what, what happens is a lot of DAWs and a lot of other things plot one point and then draw a line to the next point, draw a line to the next point. And that is really, really, really misleading. Very often you'll start seeing things that look like these square waves because that's how the program plotted it. But that's not what the signal is. Nice. Yes. Now, just so it's clear, even though I said you cannot, there's nothing in between samples, it is possible to easily design a process which will shift that entire signal by half a sample. But strangely enough, that involves interpolating the signal by a factor of two, shifting it over by one sample, and then decimating it by a factor of two. And there you have a half sample delay. Mm -hmm. Identical spectrum, but with a half sample delay. So you can do that. So, but, so is the filter making interpolation between the, the values? And yes. that's what comes out? And that's what comes out. So you've got this a, single numbers, and then it's sort of like tweening in, in animation. So mm -hmm. this is how you get from here to here. Mm -hmm. And uh, cool. Then you shift it over by one, and then you downsample again and get what you needed. Best thing when you do that process too, you don't have to. You only have to do one filter. You just have to up sample by two, because you're still not going to have any aliases because it's only half the bandwidth now. When you can, you just go over by one sample and just read out the samples. Hmm. So that is something that's very handy. Hmm. But that plot, but the thing is, it's very easy to plot things that way, but it's not, repeat, not what you're actually getting in the digital domain. It's imaginary. So, yeah, well. <laughs> it's not real. Okay. Okay, now these steps from the DAC, it's wrong. You need an ampli imaging filter. How I made that, like I said, is I filtered the first signal and you get the second signal. All those stair steps are out of bound. And if you don't have those, you get into trouble. You can get into easily get into trouble with equipment response and all sorts of things. You can also cause ringing in a DAC, especially an oversampling DAC that will give you intersample overs that weren't there before. And as we've shown in a previous talk, intersample overs cause some DACs to do, well, I'll let Bob, Bob Smith, who's gonna talk about what you see in, in actual programs in a minute, can tell you what happens when you get intersample overs. It's um, best listened to once and then never done again. So now we'll talk about subsample resolution. I, for these, I did something a little more complicated. I did these at a much higher sampling rate, but what I did was I set the noise floor to 16 bits and I shifted the thing. I basically, I went to a higher sampling rate, shifted the data up and plotted it with the noise floor. Now you see, you can make, you can, you can see both of these are entirely distinct. At 16 bits, you can't even see the noise floor. So yeah, you have subsample resolution you do i mean this whole thing you don't have time resolution better than one sample thing that now is percolated wildly through the entire uh, high-end community 
it's just wrong. It's just plain wrong. Mm -hmm. And this is done by shifting samples at the low frequency and then upsampling so you can see the plot. It's just there. Cool. And those are, you know, and this is the point is, if you want to figure out what the time resolution of a simple is, sample is, it's one divided by two times pi times the bandwidth of the signal in Hertz times we said for 16 bits, so it's two to the 16. Now you notice nowhere in here did I say sample rate. The thing that determines the frequency, re the time resolution of a signal is the system bandwidth and the noise floor not the sampling rate. Now, yeah, you can make a wider bandwidth with a higher frequency sampling rate, and then you get a higher time resolution. But what matters is the equivalent, well, specifically this bandwidth in this case is what's called the equivalent rectangular bandwidth, which means you look at the frequency response of the system and you convert it to something which has a flat response at some point and goes zero below that, and figure out what that bandwidth is so that you keep the same energy. That's called the equivalent rectangular bandwidth. Could, Something you could, go ahead. Could, could you address um, the noise floor as compared oh, to the uh, to the bit depth? Because I assume if uh, something's underneath the bit depth that it isn't. Uh, I guess I'm confused about uh, the relationship between noise floor and bit depth. Well. Bit, you know, it's just quantization. If you have 16 bits, you can get 60, 65536 defined levels. Right, right. And if you, and basically every bit gives you 6.02 dB. Yeah. Um, there's another factor in there that's a, of a couple dB. There's some factors related to peak. Uh, I'm not going to go into them right now, but that's the quantization part. You know, so you said so, quantization a minute ago. So the point is, yeah. It's the quantization level and the system bandwidth are what matters. So noise floor of what you're sampling is a different thing than this. So noise floor of you know whatever your microphones are picking up, there's noise. Oh floor. no, no, that's that noise. That this is the noise floor of the capture system. Right. That I think that's what got me confused. There. Okay. There's, the noise you know, floor right. of the. Of the, um, the presented uh, thing to go from digital that's been digitized already to be taken yeah. back. That's yeah. not this. Right. Well, the thing is, when if, if you look at the, you can have a noise floor, an analog noise floor that's higher than your quantization level. Okay. That's not, okay. A, that's not at all uncommon. But you, the point is, is you can get time resolution in that noise floor that's dependent only on the capture noise floor. Okay, Only on the quantization distortion down. That, well, that's noise. If you do it right and you dither, you have that's just noise. Okay. But the point is, you quantization will typically give you, although it's not always the case, will typically give you a flat noise. Okay. All right. Now you'll you can have other noise. You can have noise like somebody drops a dumb drumstick. Somebody might think of mm -hmm. that as noise, but mm -hmm. the point is, is this equation here gives you. The time resolution, you can figure out when that drumstick hit the floor too. I can tell you right, to the, right. yeah, it's, it's so that signal. I mean, the, the drop drumstick is signal. It's yes. In this yeah, sense, as compared to like thermal self noise or something like but that. Even, but even thermal self noise of the stuff coming into the input, you can analyze it to this resolution. Okay. This is, this is what sets the resolution of the capture system. Because it's within our bandwidth of what we're capturing. Right. Oh, it's the bandwidth sets how fast the signal can change. Okay, sweet. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, now what's the point? Time resolution is PCM is some microsecond. Let's, you know, the best anybody's reported is three microseconds. The best critical, credible I've seen is about 10 microseconds in terms of uh, interval time delays. Um, I'll take the three, even if the three red book is fine at three. 
anything that got more it's got either more noise better noise floor or a more wider bandwidth is even going to be better time to time time issues are not the problem okay now this is my point you have to have bandwidth limiting to do conventional sampling you can't have a signal shorter than two samples ever and have any kind of band limiting whatsoever. Even then, if you have two samples, the bandwidth limiting is terrible. Because the analog domain between two samples, if it happens completely between two samples, it's going to not be between two samples after it goes through the anti-aliasing filter. In the digital mean, there's actually no between the two samples. That just doesn't mean anything. Um, when the you know when does the tone well when does the tone place become a fur tone? Well, the longer it lasts, the closer it gets. But a talk we did a while ago on windowing shows different ways to maximize the spectrum of that to look like a tone. But all of those require truncating and winding, windowing and stuff like that. And this is well understood mathematics, and you will not get a twenty, a, a two sample or a five sample or ten sample twenty kilohertz tone burst through a sample a signal with, through a system with a twenty kilohertz bandwidth. You will only get the twenty kilohertz, the part of it that's under twenty kilohertz, which will not only be a twenty kilohertz signal. And now, get ready to Bob for Bob Smith to throw some stuff. Bob Smith, do you want to? You're going to introduce yourself, right? Sure, okay. I can do that. Uh, okay, I'm gonna uh, stop my share. You need to share. Yes, I got two. I've only got two displays, and I really need three. So I'm gonna eliminate my chat window and everybody else. All right, I'm Bob Smith. I uh, work for a major medical device corporation called Stryker. I work in the acoustic, uh, the acoustic systems department. But tonight I'm presenting as myself as Bob Smith of SoundSmith Labs, and I'm going to uh, discuss just briefly, this is probably only a five or 10 minute uh, discussion here, some measurement considerations where you may have seen what look like stair steps, the things that uh, JJ says you just can't have. Well, you can observe them in a very specific type of measurement that we make. Uh, small signal measurements, large signal measurements, where we are putting in um, square waves into the system. But I'm going to demonstrate that there's no uh, laws being broken or any violation of any digital rules. It is uh, all fitting within the band limiting that we have. So, um, as I mentioned, we may see stair steps. Uh, but in the following slides, we're going to demonstrate that uh, they're all necessarily band limited. And both small signal and large signal DAC output step response will be shown. And finally, I'm going to show you an example of a DAC output filter imaging. So here we are. We, this is, a, this is a, an analyzer uh, plot. This is, this is the signal generator going, uh, that we're going to send out to our DDA converter. So this is our stimulus. And you'll notice it looks like it has stair steps in there. Well, what's going on here? Well, what's happened is uh, I am purposely limiting the word length to 16 bits. I'm going to set us up for a 16-bit quantization level. And I'm running a 100 hertz triangle wave. So we have 441 samples available to distribute over eight quantization levels for one cycle. So what's going to happen is we're trying to uh, follow this triangle profile, we're going to have periods where we're spending a number of samples at each one of these steps. And then just uh, so that you can see what's going on in the frequency domain, I've got the frequency domain up here, as well as the time domain signal. This is our signal generation. Here's our DDA converters response to that. And we're, uh, by the way, we're at minus 80 dBFS. We're down at a very low level. The purpose of this is so we can uh, observe the DDA converters quantization level accuracy. How accurate is it at each of these levels? And again, we see what looks like stair steps. But the transitions between each of the stair steps, it, when we go and zoom in on them, 
we're going to find out those transitions are band limited. They have a very finite rise time. And the fact that we can spend time at these levels is just the fact that we've got so many samples to spend at a given level while we're trying to mimic this 100 hertz uh, minus 80 dBFS triangle wave. So let me switch our minus 80 dBFS triangle to a square wave. This is the signal generator once again. And it appears that it's got these edges, but they're uh, band limited as well. As we observe our response, we see that uh, here this DAC is producing a fairly faithful reproduction of that square wave with the filter ringing that you expect from the recovery filter. And it's hard to see on this particular graph, but there is a finite rise and fall time. So we're gonna switch over to an oscilloscope. Um, before we get there, I'm gonna explain a little thing, a rule of thumb that we typically use in estimating bandwidth is that we take our rise time from 10 to 90% yep. on our square wave and divide it into 0.35. And that gives us an approximation of our bandwidth. I don't wanna really go into how that rule of thumb works, but uh, there is a link here that I can also post to the chat window. Uh, it's an EDN article that has a pretty good explanation of what's going on there, but suffice it to say that 0.35 comes from the first sine coefficient contribution in a 4A transform to create a square wave. So moving on to an oscilloscope, here is that small signal square, uh, square wave. In the overview here, you can see the square wave, and then we're going to zoom in on this little portion of one of the uh, transitions. And we've figured out what our 10% and 90% level points are, and then we find our uh, time between those two points, and we see it's 17.43 microseconds. And we put our 17.43 microseconds into our rule of thumb bandwidth calculation we previously mentioned, we get 20.1 kilohertz. No laws of physics or rules of digital audio have been violated. This has got a finite uh, rise time in the transition. So just to make this a, a little clearer, I'm going to put in a large signal. Instead of uh, minus 80 dBFS, I'm now moving to minus 3 dBFS for our square wave input. This makes it a little easier to see here, and it certainly makes it a lot easier to see this transition point and to see the, the, the ringing on both sides of the transition in our filter. And here's our 10%, 90% points, and we come up with 17.62 microseconds, which... Uh, that same calculation comes up with 19.9 kilohertz, a substantially similar result to the previous uh, result. So this is what happens when we fill in all the little spaces in between by going to a 24-bit quantization level, and we see that, well, we really do have a pretty good uh, rendition of a triangle wave in our system. And uh, then when we look at the DAC response, we get uh, 20, uh, a, a fairly good rendition of the triangle wave out. So the whole thing that created the stair steps was the fact that we were band, that we were quantization level limiting to 16 bits to do a very specific measurement. And this confuses people who aren't used to looking at these measurements into thinking they're seeing the very things that JJC says you can't see, but uh, it's a very specific measurement that is within the bandwidth of the DAX output. Recovery filter is doing its thing. And to give you an example of what uh, a DAX imaging might look like, we put in uh, a random noise into the system. And uh, in this case, it's a 44, 100 uh, hertz uh, system. And we are uh, then observing on the analyzer out to 96 kilohertz. And we see the steep roll off beginning at 20 kilohertz and down by uh, 22. And then it continues to roll off. It's a very nice this is a pretty nice implementation filter. These filter implementations can vary, and sometimes you get a, a bump coming back up and maybe a couple of others down here. Uh, you know, these filter implementations are all trade-offs. So that is, I think, yep, there we go. Before I take this away from the screen, any, any questions that uh, came up on the chat window? Where is that? Um, Bob? Yes. I'll just, I'll, I'll just point out that you did this specifically without dithering. 
to avoid yes. oh, because yes, you're trying you're you're trying to avoid or sorry you're not you're trying to measure the actual reconstruction levels so you didn't dither now this leads that directly, is correct yes and that leads you to the point right here in the it's right here in this setup it, it shows that it was an undithered signal very very good yeah. point yeah because if you dither you won't see this but the point the point i was going to make was this brings us to the quantization problem which we didn't talk about tonight, but the quantization problem says this is why you really do dither if you're trying to get it right, because the dithering would take all of these extra, all of these extra lines away and just give you a flat noise. Floor. But yes, you know, I know you know that. Yes. I'm just making. Bob, you're. Yes, I, I'm, my, my purpose here is just to show that there are instances where you see something that might be confusing. But nothing is being violated here. It's it all fits within the rules and uh, of the uh, system. Bob, hey, Bob. There's a request to put up the uh, slide with the formula so someone can get a screenshot of it. There you go. Oh yes, this is this is a very old thing that that comes about directly from just calculating the exponential you get resulting from a first order filter. There's also a question about, uh, could you explain how you find the 10% and 90% points? Oh, sure. Uh, let's use this one right here. We, you'll notice that this signal here is suspiciously going from minus two to plus two volts. <laughs> Convenient that is. So uh, minus two volts, if, if, you, if we were to go out far enough so we get away from the ringing, we'll see the flat line at the minus two and the flat line at the plus two. That's where we start with our rulers, and we realize we've got a, um, a differential of four volts. Well, then what we're going to look for is 80% between those two points, or 10% away from the bottom and 10% away from the top. So we, uh, I do this calculation enough, I just go ahead and work out the formula once, put in an Excel spreadsheet, put in the, the numbers that I'll see here, and have it tell me where to set the rulers. And you can see if, if you kind of look at a line that goes along here, and we're, we're right at that point, here's 10%, and here's the other line that we're going to, and there's about the 90% point in the levels. And then we just run our sliders over until they hit the crossover point, and there's our, um, there's our time duration. And this is, this is a standard procedure, and especially doing clock measurements, uh, digital signal measurements but it also is very handy in doing analog measurements of uh, audio signals. Does that answer the question? Thanks, okay. somebody said. Sorry. You don't have yeah, a PC there's, there's blocker. A, there's a, there's a, there's a yeah, quick, oh yeah, okay, you saw it, Bob. No, you look, look down here and we see that uh, we're allowing, we're making a measurement that can tell whether we've got DC capability out of this DAC, and this DAC can produce DC. Not every, uh, not every DAC does. Some of them have uh, a high pass filter <laughs> down at five or ten hertz, um, and uh, you'll you'll be able to see it if you you could tell in this overview, depending upon the shape. That if it if it falls straight across like this, you got DC. But if it starts falling down, and depending upon how it falls down, you can tell whether you got a capacitor or some other form of a high pass filter going on in there. Bob, could you repeat the question for late people that don't have won't have the chat window? Uh, oh, um, there was a there was a follow up point. You also don't have a DC blocker, right? And no, there's a. Uh, this uh, where you'll notice. Uh, sorry, sorry, Bob. What's this? Inter there's some kind of weird interference happening. Bob you. is distorting. It's on yeah. you. Oh, I'm distorting. Yeah, yeah you're about a well, second probably... late. You're, uh, you're. You sound like a yeah. robot. Galloping. Yeah. yeah. Okay, my assistant. Okay. I've had it on long enough, and I think there's something. I think there's something. I think there's something. I had that red, 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 red. Wow, Bob, you've turned into a robot. You got to stop. Okay, what's going? What's going on right now is for some reason you're getting some really heavy aliasing. I don't know why, but that sound you just—if people want to know what uh, ali what aliasing sounds like, you just heard it. 
Wow. Bob was not paying attention to the presentation, apparently. How <laughs> useful. That's a, as they say, that's the coolest sound of the evening so far. In, uh, that, that was, in fact, what you heard was aliasing. It sounded to me like something cut his sampling rate by a factor of about four. And you were hearing lots and lots of aliasing. That's what, that's what speech, if you take speech and you capture it at eight kilohertz sampling rate, um, without any filter, that's almost exactly what speech sounds like. Hmm. Having worked at the telcos, it's more than once or twice that I've heard that sound. <laughs> the other interesting thing to me was that I've got Bob's picture on one screen and the full screen presentation on another TV. And his voice was about uh, a second ahead of the video. A lot. Oh. It was really far. So have like things this. gotten a little better? No. Okay, there's... They, it, there's start, a, it started to, and then you got robot again. Yes. Okay, what's going on is you've got two sources of audio going on. One of them is delayed about a second, and the one that's delayed about a second is also alias to, to hack. No, I only have one source, but it's, it's an interaction between Zoom and the ATEM. A mini oh, there, pro. Now you're good. Is it good for the moment? Yeah, good for the moment. Well, it may not last. I also checked real quickly, and Webroot was deciding to run a scan while I was trying to do this. Uh, there's where your sample rate went. Yeah. <laughs> so, JJ, is, is that the end of the presentation? And Dan can come up again and uh, bring and it's, it is back back to Dan. Cool. So, so we who can turn on our videos can turn on our videos, and Dan can uh, take us into our greetings world. Yeah, give me a second here to uh, do that. And some people are are escaping the building before they get to say hi. So that's all good. <laughs> well, and I do too. I've got an early call tomorrow morning, so I'm going to bail on you guys. Bob, thank you so much for your Dalek speech. That was really yeah. Lovely. Thanks, Bob. You're welcome. <laughs> Hopefully, that pr I will provide the. Uh, um, PowerPoint deck a little later for you to make available to everybody. Awesome. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bob. Yes, and the PowerPoint deck that I use tonight is the same one that's already on the website. All right. So thanks, JJ and Bob. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments for JJ? And I think Bob is gone already. So you got any questions or comments for JJ or Steve or anybody else? And at this stage, all of us who are not speaking are muted. Correct. Comments, anybody? All right, let's go to, uh, yeah, here's a good one. Are there any general comments about human perceptibility of various sample rates? <laughs> there are a lot of comments. Um, there needs to be some very carefully run tests that I don't think have happened yet. And? That's my comment. There need to be some very <laughs> carefully run tests. And specifically, things like there's the web tests that have been run have been done with different DACs different places. The difficulty with most of these tests is because you have to document things like what anti-aliasing filter is being used, what anti-imaging filter is being used, as well as testing the perceptibility if you're going to discover any of these nonlinear effects. There's also, of course, the issue if you have an eight-year-old kid taking the test, they can probably hear 22 or 23 kilohertz because they haven't, been, haven't had that pounded out of their cochlea yet. Okay. Anything else? That means we had a clean talk. Yeah, very nice. Okay, Michael replies, Michael, you can unmute yourself and ask your question yourself. And that's true of everybody, if you'd like to. Yeah, oh, sure. Oh, I'll wait. just read it, say it out loud. So Good. I've heard FIR and IIR described as linear phase and minimum phase. Is that a different name for the same thing, or are they just related but not the same thing? Um, they are different things, but 
F IIRs are generally minimum phase until you get into things like elliptic filters that actually have zeros that are outside the, uh, th that are in the wrong half plane. But to explain what minimum phase means is it means that all the zeros and all of the, all the zeros and all of the poles are in the stable region. Okay, that's what minimum phase means. Linear phase means that the, that the impulse response is symmetric. It can be either even or odd, but it has to be symmetric. It basically means that equation I get where uh, phi equals two pi ft, that's what, that's what defines a uh, linear phase filter. Now, FIR filters are usually designed that way, but do not have to be, okay? Hope that helps. Yeah, there's another aspect people say about causal versus a causal. You can't look into the future. You can only look into the past. Well, that's the delay. Right. You know, you you don't you can't look into the future. If you come up with an a causal filter, you just have to start at the beginning of the impulse response, and now you have a delay. Do all linear phase filters have to look into the future? Uh, all linear phase filters have to have to be have to have a symmetric waveform about the center. So, if you're talking about mathematically, it depends exactly on how you're defining the filter. But basically, the peak of the filter will not come at the beginning of a of a constant delay filter. And I call it constant delay, not linear phase. Okay, because it really is constant delay. Uh, Linear phase, yeah, linear phase is something that came out in the 1960s when people started to figure out how to design FIR filters, but it really means constant delay. And okay. constant, constant delay filters are symmetric, always, or, or anti-symmetric. But if you think about it, if it's an anti-symmetric filter, it can have no, it can, it has to have zero DC response because the sum of all the coefficients is going to be zero and that's the DC response. And Don put a uh, comment and Juan is putting a comment in, in here that they may want to, you know, review. Let's see. I... Well, you cannot get linear phase IIRs. That's the one thing I will say. Because an IIR is infinite impulse response. That means it has to be infinite in both directions. You can get nearly infinite impulse response, yes, but you cannot get an infinite impulse response. Sorry for my bad video, but I had to move up my screen to squint at it because I forgot my reading glasses. No problem. Thank you. And Any by other the way, comments? Quick, just to here. say, there's also such a thing as a mixed phase filter, which is partly minimum phase, partly constant delay. Yes, oh, that is correct. What uh, somebody just said is mentioned if you flip the signal and process it again, it becomes linear phase. That is correct. But what you've done is basically you've accounted for that whole time delay, that, that whole infinite impulse response by truncating it some, at some point. So what you've done is now you've truncated the IIR filter. And then when you flip it and you play it back the other way, now you have a linear phase, a uh, constant delay filter. But the um, thing I was going to make is you can have constant delay filters. You have minimum delay filters. You have something called a maximum delay filter. You can just as well put all of the zeros in an FIR outside the unit circle, in which case you get a filter which has the maximum delay and pretty much, well, basically it's the same phase shift as you had before, except with, except it's flipped around in time and it's absurd amounts of phase shift, basically. So minimum phase and, and minimum phase means that the zeros and the, the, the everything is inside, the, all the roots are inside the unit circle for digital or on the, they're all in the left half plane for analog. Maybe, and not Amy all. Amy asks, would the trick of running IIR in both directions sound as good as an FIR linear filter? Well, effectively, that's what you've done. 
you've doubled the filter, you've taken the IR filter, you've doubled the, fre the frequency modifications uh, when you run it in both directions because you're running it through the filter twice and you've truncated it at some length when it looks like the filter has run out of data. So basically you've made it into, an FI into a uh, symmetric FIR filter by running it both directions. Those of you who have MATLAB, that's called filt filt. Very handy thing to use sometimes. One of the reasons you use that is if you're actually trying to modify a phase spectrum and you don't want to shift the, the frequency meaning of the phase spectrum. I saw at least one person in the pictures wins. <laughs> so Dan, should we go to introductions yet? Yeah, if we're through with questions, there's more questions coming up, which is good. Right. I don't see any new ones right now, but this has been a nice run this last five minutes or so. Anything else from anybody? before we move on.